Who are the people that should be kicked out of society? Let's find out. Starting with... Number four, out of time. Anthony Farrer ran a thriving luxury consignment business until FBI agents arrested him for scamming customers out of $3 million. Farrer's store, the timepiece gentleman, was located on Hollywood's Rodeo Drive. He drove around town in a Lamborghini or one of his Ducati motorcycles, lived in an insanely expensive rental in Santa Monica, and enjoyed frequent gambling trips to Las Vegas. Farrer shared photos and videos of watches to his 300,000 followers on Instagram and YouTube. His collection of expensive wristwatches included Patek Philippe's, Rolexes, and more, which he sold to collectors. People would ask him to consign watches for sale and agreed to Farrer taking a 5% commission on every sale. The problem is that the only person making money was Farrer. Some people wired Farrer funds to buy a watch, but never received it or got their money back. Others received pieces different from the ones they paid for. Farrer offered to give one upset customer a Rolex watch in place of a refund. Another victim consigned 75 watches to the scammer worth $3.2 million. He only got $385,000 back. Victims contacted law enforcement, but Farrer closed his store before police could get there. Farrer took to social media to come clean about his shady business dealings as the accusations grew. He said that he was in a lot of debt because of his gambling problem and had grown accustomed to a luxury lifestyle, so that totally makes it okay. Like, if you're used to living it up, why should you have to stop, right? As of this video, Farr is in an L.A. federal jail awaiting his arraignment. If found guilty, he faces up to 20 years in federal prison. Always be wary of anyone who brags too much. Their stories almost never match reality. Looks like Farr will be showing off his new slip-ons. Number 3. Extra Sugar, Please! Former 50s and 60s movie star Gina Lala Brigida's assistant, Andrea Piazzola, stole $11 million from his former employer before she passed away at the age of 95. Piazzola started working for Lala Brigida's assistant in 2009 when he was 21 and had met her through one of his friends who was the son of another employee. Piazzola took on the job performing mindless tasks around the home, but at that point, his life was already in turmoil. Having never gone to college and barely supporting himself financially, Piazzolla often leaned on his girlfriends to look after him. When he got one of his partners pregnant, he denied the baby existed until she took him to court to force him to pay child support. But rather than learn his lesson, Piazzolla did the exact same thing with another girlfriend shortly after. Gina Lala Brigida was rich and famous, and mostly known for her roles in Beat the Devil and Trapeze, a couple of big films in the 50s. But as she aged, she experienced mental problems and needed a bit of help around the house. And Piazzolla, being a total parasite, saw her situation as a money-making opportunity and started licking his greedy chops. So he moved into her home and worked hard to get close to her. But in order to get close, he needed to get rid of the other influences in her life. Piazzolla started planting ideas in his employer's mind, like he's Cobb from Inception, telling that her lawyer was stealing from her and that her administrator, Lola Brigida worked with, was the lawyer's spy. He also told the housekeeper, who was in her 80s and had a heart problem, that she had to leave the premises. Once Piazzolla mostly isolated her from the people in her inner circle, he became the sole director of Lala Brigida's company. But the assistant struggled to get her away from her husband, Spanish businessman Javier Regal. Javier was the only person that Lala Brigida defended against Piazzolla's accusations. But as her mental decline worsened, Piazzolla finally convinced her that her husband had tricked her into a marriage without her consent. So Lala Brigida cut ties with Javier, saying he tricked her into getting married the day before so he could access her money. While Javier denied the claims, there were reasons to be suspicious about his intentions with the star, who was once considered to be the most beautiful woman alive. In fact, during the height of her Hollywood career, he hadn't even been born yet. The two met at a party in Monte Carlo when Javier was 23 and Lola Brigida was 57. That's a 34-year age gap. 
Although the Gap raised eyebrows, as it should, Javier insisted they were in a happy relationship until his late wife met Piazzolla. But there were accusations of faking their 2010 wedding since the couple had split three years before. Also, the marriage was done by proxy, where one person uses a stand-in rather than showing up. In this case, Lola Brigida using the stand-in, which is incredibly weird, but it's apparently a thing. Javier also appeared in a fraud and forgery trial in Italy in 2016. So it's not like it was difficult difficult to convince Lola Brigida that something was up with her young husband. Lola Brigida testified that they always slept in separate rooms while traveling and never engaged in intimate relationships. These statements were a far cry from the one she made in Spain's Hola magazine in 2006 when she bragged about their passionate relationship. Javier said that he barely recognized the woman he saw in court that day. Lola Brigida spent a prolonged time in hospital following surgery for a broken femur and passed away in January of 2023. At that point, Piazzo was in complete control of everything to do with her, especially her relationships. He even tried to stop her only son, Milo Skofic, from seeing her before she passed. The two once had a great relationship, with Milo frequently visiting his mother, but when Piazzolla came around, that all changed. Her assistant, doing his best impression of Grima Wormtongue, was there whenever he tried to visit or speak with her. Despite Piazzolla's attempts to block him, Milo was able to visit her when she was close to the end. He said his mother cried as she told him she had done everything everything wrong. During Lola Brigida's decline, Piazzolla stole from her so he could buy expensive properties, cars, and jewelry. He also emptied her home of furniture, which was an accumulation of one-of-a-kind items she had bought throughout her life from antique dealers in front of her eyes. Piazzolla had told her that he was having everything restored, and since they were antiques, it was easy to believe, but instead of restorations, he just sold it all at auctions. Javier and Milo eventually called the police, leading to Piazzolla's arrest, and he finally ended up in court. Parts of the trial occurred while Lola Brigida was still alive. She gave a testimony where she described Piazzolla as being like a son to her and that her own child Milo only came around when he wanted something, which was probably something Piazzolla told her rather than being factual. The disgraced former assistant was ultimately convicted of taking advantage of the actress's weakened mental state in order to relieve her of her assets. Piazzolla received a three-year jail sentence and faces two more trials for additional charges. Number two, homeless burglars. The police caught two Albanian immigrants attempting to rob a soccer player's $1.9 million home. Sebastian Joni and Skeladano Koliki targeted a wealthy part of Cheshire in England, often called the footballer belt due to the number of soccer players that call the area home. Joni and Koliki forced their way into the property at around 8 p.m. The homeowners were upstairs when they heard strange noises from downstairs. One of them looked outside of their bedroom window to see one of the two intruders walking up the stairs case with his face partially covered, which is typically not what you want to see walking up your stairs. Unsure if the robbers were carrying weapons, the homeowners panicked and locked themselves in their bedrooms so they could call the police. The pair were still in their room when law enforcement arrived 13 minutes later. Joni and Kaliki fled, leaving footprints in the recent snow on the ground, and with the help of a police dog, officers found the men. The two men hadn't damaged the property or taken anything from the premises. Joni immediately expressed remorse and told the police he was glad they caught them. He explained that they never wanted to cause damage to the property, but it was extremely cold outside, and he and Kaliki had nowhere to go. The authorities asked the two where they worked and how much money they made. Kaliki answered that he worked under the table and made $60 to $75 a day, while Joni admitted that he was homeless and hadn't been able to hold a job since he arrived in the UK in 2018. They were both in their early 20s at the time of their arrest and had entered Britain illegally when they were in their late teens hoping to find work. Unfortunately, it had been a lot harder than they anticipated. Joni left Albania when he was 14 and headed to Germany. After a few years there, he arrived in Britain on a wagon and met up with his father, who was in the country legally. He worked to help support his mother and grandmother, who were still in Albania. Joni was extremely intelligent. He was fluent in Italian, German, and English, and conversational in Spanish and Portuguese. Kaliki, on the other hand, barely spoke English, making it almost impossible for him to find a well-paid job. He worked for people who exploited his desperation to find work and barely paid him enough money to get by. A friend told him that Manchester, often referred to as England's capital of the north, would have better job prospects, so he left London with Joni. At the time, Kaliki was ashamed to be living in his car. Both men pleaded guilty to burglary, and the judge sentenced Joni to 28 months in prison and Kaliki to 18 months. The defense asked for leniency with the migrants who would be in danger if they went back to their home country, and highlighted that they didn't take or damage anything on the property. They also stated that Kaliki's limited English would make jail extremely difficult for 
for him. However, the sentencing judge sided with the victims, who were traumatized by the shock of having intruders in their home. Kaliki and Joni faced deportation when they left prison. For Kaliki, this meant putting his life in danger, as part of the reason he left Albania was because he was in the middle of a blood feud. What do you think is the right answer here? What are people supposed to do when they supposedly have nowhere to go? If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out how this supposed money manager simply just spent all his investors' money. Number one, the bad Baroness. Baroness Michelle Moan used her social media platforms to tell the tale of her rise to fame and fortune after growing up in poverty until she admitted to being connected to a disgraced PPE firm where they made personal protection equipment. Moan made first her name with Ultimo, a bra company, and she served as a member of the UK's House of Lords. She preached entrepreneurship and shared her fairy tale life story of going from rags to riches when she got the idea for Ultimo, the push-up bra that earned her fame and fortune. In the early days of the coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic, when shortages in personal protective equipment affected people worldwide, Moan had recommended PPE MedPro to the British government. So the company won a $253 million government contract, but there was something off about the entire negotiation. In May of 2020, Moan had reached out to Michael Goh, the cabinet office minister at the time, and Theodore Agnew to talk about contracts with the PPE company. In their conversation, she offered to supply PPE equipment via her team, which was fine, but the conversation occurred five days before her husband's business associates incorporated PPE MedPro, meaning PPE MedPro wasn't even actually a company yet, which makes it look like the couple was trying to profit off the pandemic. The firm entered the VIP lane that the government used for contracts with politically connected companies, but the products were nothing like what Moan promised. As an example, there was an order for a supply of sterile gowns, but they were unfit for PPE purposes and couldn't be used. Moan denied involvement in PPE MedPro until leaked bank documents revealed that her husband, Doug Barrowman, had received $82 million in profits. He transformed portions of the money to a secret offshore trust, which Moan was a beneficiary of. Shady. After the money came through, the couple bought a private jet, a yacht, and several properties. Their actions put them on the National Crime Agency's radar, which raided two of the couple's multi-million dollar homes. The House of Lords commissioner opened an investigation into Moan, but paused it pending the NCA's investigation. Moan made a public statement explaining she was taking a leave of absence to clear her name. For someone who wants to inspire online with her rags-to-riches story, she sure up to a lot of shady business. But isn't that how it always is these days? It's like we're all getting catfished all the time by everyone. Who's someone you'd think would never scam anyone? Would it be Philip Ryle, an Amish ice cream store owner? Or would it be Paul Rinfret, a seemingly trustworthy fund manager? Let's get right to it. Number four, Wall Street Ponzi. After starting his investment fund, Plan Dome Partners LLC, Paul Rinfret boasted about how his investment strategy earned them triple digit returns. Each month since 2012, they claimed that they had consistently made more money. Paul Rinfret was a man with a luxurious palate, spending over $19 million on cigars, alcohol, cars, house renovations, you name it, and he bought it. He used the money to buy his dry cleaning, gas, and other daily expenses. Paul even spent $30,000 on a venue called The Water Club in Manhattan so his son could host a red carpet themed engagement party. Of course, we all want to give our families the best. And how else do we do that if not with money? The issue was that Paul did all this without spending a dime of his own money. On September 29th, 2020, Paul was sentenced to five years in prison for running a $19 million Ponzi scheme from 2016 to 2019. For returning viewers, you already know this, but for new viewers, a Ponzi scheme is when you pay current investors with the money used by new investors. It's similar to a pyramid scheme, except there's no recruiting under the pretenses of selling things to make money. Paul promised investors that if they put their money into Plan Dome Partners, he would invest their money to trade futures contracts tied to S&P 500. He claimed that he had created a foolproof trading algorithm and would only take 25% of net profits. In reality, 
He only used a small portion of their money and the rest to fund his luxury lifestyle. On top of that, the little money he actually did put to trading, he would often end up losing money. He would create fake statements that looked like his clients were making big bucks to stop them from pulling out. Overall, he scammed six investors out of their money. If that wasn't bad enough, he also opened accounts with a brokerage firm using the names of his family members, one being his son, John, who Paul had paid for his engagement party. Another was a family member who had passed away in 2014, and Paul had continued pretending to be this family member until 2016, long after they had passed. Paul's family claimed they were unaware of the fraud committed under their names. Instead, they thought of him as a brilliant investor. They lived in the lap of luxury, having the ability to spend $50,000 on a Hamptons vacation rental and over $400,000 on restaurants, jewelry, and shoes. He used his investors' money to pay for tanning services, student loans, car washes, and other personal expenses as well. Paul also transferred $845,000 to two companies controlled by his wife Denise, one of them being the Rinfret Group, an interior design company co-run by their daughter Missy. Denise and Missy had to write a statement claiming they had no idea that Paul had earned money fraudulently. Along with this, Paul sent $325,000 to his son John and $675,000 to his son-in-law. His family claimed they were under the impression that he had legitimately earned all of this money. Paul Renfret is still in jail, having served two out of the five-year sentence he received. After his prison time, he'll still have two more years of supervised release. He had to forfeit over $20 million and pay over $12 million in restitution for his targets. His home sits, overtaken by vines, foreclosed after his arrest. Having once had a loving family, his now ex-wife Denise and their children no longer speak to him. After living at the top for many years, Paul Renfret is a perfect example of the higher you sit, the harder you fall. Number three, scamming exec. Now let's take a trip down to Sydney, Australia, where we can find two women under trial for a $40 million scam connected to NAB, the Australian National Bank. An unknown whistleblower sent executives at the bank an outline claiming that Rosemary Rogers had been receiving money from the chief executive of an events company named Human Group, Helen Rosamond, for years. Rosemary, former chief of staff at NAB, turned herself into the police after suspicion of the scam. During the investigation, Rosemary struck a deal to decrease her sentence by providing information proving that Helen was involved. What a way to break up a friendship, but what they discovered since then is crucial. Allegedly, Helen offered gifts and money, intending to leave the bill to be paid by the bank. Helen made invoices to look like NAB expenses, and Rosemary ensured that the bank staff paid all the fraudulent invoices. Helen was known by all her friends to be quite generous. One of her more considerable expenses included a $620,000 trip where she took family and friends to America and had them travel by yachts and private jets. Helen bought Rosemary a luxury car and a boat. She also spent over $30,000 on a fuel tab, a friend's 70th birthday bash, and a $132,000 trip to the Rocky Mountains. The largest bill was $2.2 million, so Rosemary could buy a house and send $700,000 into Helen's pocket. They marked it as an expense for Project Eagle, the code name for the onboarding event of Mike Baird as a NAB executive in 2017. Prosecutor think Human Group had nothing to do with the Project Eagle event. While Rosemary pleaded guilty to accepting bribes, 47-year-old Helen Rosamond pleaded not guilty to 60 counts of bank fraud and 32 counts of attempting to obtain an advantage by deception. Rosemary has since been on trial and sentenced to eight years in prison. Helen's trial, on the other hand, was set for 2021. In August, her counsel applied to extend the date, stating that she could afford a legal team because the National Australian Bank had frozen all of her assets. This application application was approved, and her trial date was set for early 2022. As of the upload of this video, the trial has yet to take place, but Helen's lawyer has stated that he plans to prove that Rosemary had taken all the benefits for herself. Number 2. Amish Scamming when you think of the ice cream man, what comes to mind? A man in an ice cream truck ready to pull out whichever ice cream you want. Or maybe a smiling guy behind a counter scooping whatever flavor you ask. Does it involve scamming families who go to your church out of millions of dollars? Philip Elvin Real, the 68-year-old owner of Trickling Springs Creamery, scammed hundreds of Amish and Mennonite investors out of $60 million over 10 years. In what was known as the largest Ponzi scheme in Pennsylvania, 
Philip used the fact that he and his targets were part of the same religion to build trust with his investors. This is commonly known as affinity fraud, an investment scam that preys on members of similar identifying groups such as religion or ethnic groups. It's safe to say that people tend to trust those who worship at the same church. Those communities tend to build a group willing to help one another, but Philip wasn't interested in anyone but himself. He had lured investors to a fund that made out loans to Trickling Springs Creamery, Philip's dairy farm. Here, they sold milk, cheese, yogurt, and ice cream. Philip led investors under the pretenses that Trickling Springs was profitable, and in reality, the creamery was on its way downhill. Philip had used new investors' money to pay off old investors, and by December 2019, they had lost $59.7 million. Talk about milking his friends out of their money. In February of 2020, Philip pleaded guilty to conspiracy and fraud charges having to do with the Ponzi scheme. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison with three years of supervised release. Along with the jail time, the judge ordered him to pay a little less than $60 million in restitution, and he also had to forfeit $59 million along with the two real estate properties. It shows that you always have more to lose when you commit fraud. Trickling Springs Creamery filed for bankruptcy in September 2019 and shut its doors later that December. Just nine months later, the owners of South Mountain Creamery, a dairy farm in Maryland, announced that they had acquired Trickling Springs, revamping their decor and merchandise by adding a new artisanal products like freshly baked bread and local honey. It's good to see that the creamery still has the potential to thrive in new hands. Number 1. Vulnerable Vets 68-year-old Scott Cohn was living large in his California mansion, knowing that he had been scamming thousands of veterans into high-interest loans. Scott and his three co-conspirators created a corporation called Future Income Payments LLC, which promised investors up to 8% profit on their investments. During this time, the scam artists were reaching out to veterans in financial distress and offering lump sums in exchange for the rights to their monthly pensions. Unbeknownst to their targets, their contracts would end with tons of hidden fees and up to 240% interest on their loans. This led to the $300 million Ponzi scheme and the financial ruin of roughly 13,000 people. Scott was getting into trouble for years before the giant Ponzi scheme. In 1988, he opened 47 businesses that have since shut their doors. Then, in 2006, he was charged with three felonies for selling counterfeit computer parts. Scott pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 15 months in prison. Shortly after was when he started his biggest scam. He started started Future Income Payments LLC and 20 other companies to run his complex Ponzi scheme. Scott had ordered that they use late night advertising in the internet to reach more people. He even had one of his co-conspirators host a 90 minute seminar called Social Security Facts 101. During this seminar, he convinced investors to allow Black Harbor Wealth Management, one of Scott's businesses, to be their financial advisor. He claimed that he had heard all the horror stories and promised this wouldn't be one. Unfortunately, he forgot to mention the 60 clients in South Carolina that his company had already become a horror story to. Black Harbor played a significant role in this scheme by being the primary way of gaining investors. Once investors put their money in the hands of Black Harbor, Scott would use it to give out loans to struggling veterans coming to future income payments. One alleged target was a veteran trying to pay for his wife's cancer treatment. He originally went to Scott for a $5,000 loan, not knowing that soon he would end up charging 50% of hidden fees and 240% interest on that loan. Another target was a school librarian named Mary Orem. She invested over $50,000 of her money she saved over 25 years working in a high school. When the time came, she was promised a 6 to 8% annual profit and hoped it would keep her out of a nursing home. Now, she's lost all but $6,000, one of the thousands who had lost money. Meanwhile, Scott lived a lavish lifestyle in an exclusive gated community, a $4.8 million mansion overlooking the Pacific Ocean just south of LA. He spent a lot of his money on the house and paid for the pool maintenance, furniture, and carpets, HOA fees, and a custom painter for the place. I guess they say a man's home is his castle. After months of trying to track Scott down, the FBI found him living out of a rented house and eating at IHOP in San Diego as a man named Russell Armstrong. Scott had stolen an ID from a man who had died in 2018. They think he had used cash to stay in hotels for a while before renting the home. When Scott was arrested, they charged him with conspiracy to commit wire fraud and mail fraud. 
They found that his scheme had affected people across 25 states. On August 18th, 2022, he was sentenced to 10 years and was ordered to pay $501 million in restitution and penalties. Although most people often never see their money again, we hope it doesn't take too long to liquidate Scott's assets so the people who were scammed by him can have justice for the fraud committed. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what superpower you'd rather have. The ability to rewind or redo the last hour of your life as many times as you want, or the ability to know the outcomes of any decision you make.